Mana and Dagushimi, man and Daguhim Bashe, Mana, send your man around you to Fiona, Mammy, send your Fiona Mukoga and Jay. Young Mukon, I'll get a rope, Majan of Yango to Andy Kamushing on your iPhone, a man of Yanga, one of Fasha, go quicker, one of the show. can't hide our hearts away from those needs and just because they're not in our country doesn't mean that it shouldn't move us and so many people have already been moved I know you have you've been praying all month long as I've asked you to now's the moment where we actually do something about what we believe Hello? Hello? Hi, ni mama Fion? Ya, ni kwa Freddy, mwana na Afrika ni Life Ministries. Ama kurumeza mfite nuko, Fiona, ya wani mwishigizi. Fiona? <laughs> ya wani mutera hunga? Ya, ugorero muze kumushinga, kwa andi kurugwa andi ko, nugu tanjira kwa andi anu mwishigizi.
is Stacy, and my family and I are so honored to be your sponsor with Africa New Life. My husband Vance and I have three children, Kenna, Emily, and Addie. We are so excited to learn about your life in Rwanda. Our daughter Addie is 13 years old and loves to play volleyball, go to church, and be with her friends. We don't know where the harvest will be. It could be a little girl that will end up being a 737 pilot over Rwanda. Maybe when I'm going to see our sponsored child or you're going to see it, she's flying us into Rwanda. You don't know where it will be, but we do know that their life as it is today can be altered and the trajectory of generations can be changed.
But I want Alan to talk a little bit about African New Life, how I got started. What is everybody that's sitting here like, great, those kids on the screen. And by the way, that video was produced and that family actually lives and resides here in our church. Addie, stand up for a minute right now. That is beautiful, Addie. Who's in the village, who's in the, uh, who's in the video. Which, which, by the way, the whole time we were in Africa, in Rwanda, everybody assumed that she was my child because of the resemblance that we have. But she's actually, where's Stacy and Vance? Is Stacy and Vance anywhere near so you can see who they are? Get in the light so they can see you. There, there's Stacy and Vance right there. Um, you got to pray for them because they got more than they bargained for with this one right here. You can sit down, baby. Thank you. She is a beautiful addition and wonderful member of our church and of our team. Love to see you in worship and singing and doing your thing. Yeah, I love you too, baby. Um, Alan, back to you. Tell us about African New Life, brother. Well, uh, African New Life exists to transform lives and communities by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and acting compassionately in his name. But it was born 30 years ago out of tragedy. There was uh, in Rwanda in 1994, Africa, a genocide that took the lives of a million people in just about three months. And uh, Pastor Charles Magisha, who you saw at the end of the video with the kids, right? In a victorious moment, but back then it was a horrifying situation. Pastor Charles was there as a young pastor, 27 years old, and uh, seeing the carnage and seeing hundreds of thousands of kids literally who lost their parents in the genocide and were orphaned. And he said to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to dedicate my life, the rest of my life, to helping as many of these kids as I possibly can. A few years after that, God opened the door for him to come here mm -hmm. to Portland, Oregon, to go to Multnomah University and get his master's degree. And there he wrote a master plan for what he wanted to do in Rwanda. And it was, it was really four things. It was train pastors in, in proclamation, right? Train pastors, plant churches medical, help with the medical, and then make sure that kids had access to education. And uh, so since then, that was, that was 2000, 2001 when he was here. Since then, that story that you saw on the screen has happened 16,000 times. Come on, come on. 16. <laughs> wow. In addition to that, we've planted 10 churches. One of them, Huye, we've done together here at East Hill. And uh, about 8,000 people go to those churches every Sunday morning there. We have a Bible college that's training pastors in the hundreds, and the hospital sees about 60,000 patients a year. A 1,000 babies are born. It's amazing what God has done, and, uh, and it's the Lord, ultimately, that he's done it. Yeah. Hey, Alan, they, for, for those that don't know, and, and I don't want you to begin at our association, okay. part with the gen started the genesis of the dream. How did East Hill... African New Life, what is the genesis and where is that partnership now? You know, Jason Abella, who was your predecessor here, uh, came to Rwanda. Actually, Arlen came to Rwanda in 2017. That's right. That's right. Came to Rwanda and we began to talk about what could we do? Could we do something like this? And then uh, Jason actually came with me to Rwanda. He announced his resignation on the stage one day, and the next day we got on a plane and went to Rwanda. Here, wait. So I didn't know that. Yeah, let me tell you more. So, so let me ahead. tell you. Okay. So while he's in Rwanda. I was there. He sent me a text message. I, I was I, watching. I was there. And he was like, he I was said. telling me. Can he's, I finish the saying, story? Saying, okay. As we were praying about our next steps, we were at Beaverton Foursquare. We were praying about where God wanted us next. I text Jason because I had said I won't even consider coming to East Hill because he was such a good friend. And I didn't want to come behind him and. It was just some reasons. And I gave him a text and I said, tell me about East Hill. And he gave me, if you know Jason Abello, he's full of words. And so it was this long of a text. I'm not joking. It was this long. And he was telling me all the things that he had dreamed about East Hill that he couldn't get to, that he didn't get to do, that he wished he had. And then he says at the end, and there's nobody I can think of more perfectly positioned to lead East Hill in the future than Keith Jenkins. And so it's kind of weird that that was the confluence and the, the dream of East Hill and African New Life was actually happening while you guys were there. Yeah, I mean, we were on the safari when he was texting you. <laughs> he should have been watching for animals, man. Come on. Then, yeah, it's a long safari. It is. Yeah, it is. 
you guys all need to come and do that. But in any, and I said to him, well, if he comes, will you put in a good word for me? For and he's like, yeah, I'll take care of it, Alan. Don't worry. So, so that's the story. But, but, but then, right. but then, man, COVID happened. Yep. And uh, I just started emailing you kind of every day because I was stuck in my house. Like every, me at it, six it was, in the it was morning. terrible, yeah. But the Lord used that to build a friendship, ultimately. And uh, back in A18, he invited me in to share with the Missions Commission here. And uh, July of 2021, we were in a meeting, and I was sharing about sponsorship and about the issue. When you talk about it, it boils down to a couple of things, right? In Rwanda, school beyond primary school is not free, right? So what that means is that about right now, even 60% of kids... In Huye, Rwanda, where we specifically work right. with East Hill, but all over the country, without outside help financially, 60% of kids will not make it beyond grade school, elementary school, which means they're going to be stuck in the same level of poverty, and, and, and it's difficult, right, until they, uh, their whole lives. But that's where sponsorship comes in. So there's another statistic you need to know. The 60% of kids don't get to go, but the World Bank did a study, and they found, of, of people in poverty, they found in Rwanda that less than 2% of people who live in poverty in Rwanda have a high school diploma. So what that tells you is, if you have a high school diploma in Rwanda, or a trade school diploma, you can pull yourself out of poverty. Mm. So for us at Africa New Life, our commitment is to get kids through high school. And so we were talking about that in this meeting yeah. with you and your staff, and you stopped the meeting. Do you remember? Uh, vaguely. Yes. <laughs> and he says, hey, guys, we had a plan for October. We're canceling that plan. And the look on your staff face like, okay. Trust me. But I you remember. Know, the, <laughs> the Lord worked, right? And we got a whole bunch of kids. But that was the beginning of this mm -hmm. whole thing. I think that the goal we set out, Coco, remind me, I think we said we wanted to sponsor 250 kids in five years. Is that right? Or two years? Something like Stacy, somebody. But, but it was a... Let's just say that, that moment, God blew the box because 250 kids got sponsored that day. Come on, yeah, give the Lord a hand right, clap right, right now. Right. Yeah. And earlier today, I think we're at 430 total here at East Hill. So how many of you guys sponsor? Raise your hand. Yeah, good number of you. We're at 430. We were at the start of today. Today, I mean, the truth is we have 100 profiles out there. Yeah, hold on. I'll tell you, they just texted me. I could feel my booty vibrating. Hold on. <laughs> Should turn it, that thing we off. Have, yeah. We have 58 kids sponsored in the last service. Wow. Yeah, 58. So I, I, just so you know where my faith was, I was thinking if we got 35 more kids, it would be great. But God seems to always exceed what we think. Amen. God's good. Amen. Alan, would you, would you catch us up? We know there were 430 kids when we started this, this morning. It was pushing 480. We were hoping for 500. But what's been done in Huye through East Hill? Could you kind of give them an, an overview? Yeah, I think you guys saw the slide already. We have, uh, we've done a number of things. But let's throw up the slide about the church. So, you know, and, and this is what's important. Huye, Rwanda is in the southern part of Rwanda. So the capital city is Kigali, which is about four hours north. <laughs> It's a long drive. We've been on it in a van. I, I get him a good van now when we go. It's a good van. It's Thank a good you. Van. But, it, but to think about this, the reason this city is strategic, it is where mm. the most significant university in the country is. It's where the doctors and the lawyers and the politicians and the leaders of the country are trained. So we feel like, felt like strategically, we need to, it's a lot like the University of Oregon. He said it. I didn't. Influential yeah. school. He didn't mention that other school in Corvallis. Just saying. <laughs> but go ahead. God's using you right now. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful school. So we built this church. You guys were all, a lot of you that were in on this, wanted to build a church that's literally walking distance from the, from the school. And the church you saw in the video is that church. It is that church. The child development office that you saw in the video, it's that, it's, that's it, right? And you guys gave and sacrificed as a church, yeah, in offerings, and then individually, some of you gave significantly, and man, we got it done, and it's there, and it's a lighthouse until Jesus comes. Come on, come on. I mean, think of that, think of that. There's a church in Rwanda that's been built and exists because of a church 
being generous and having open hearts in Gresham, Oregon, is impacting the other side of the world. Come on, you can give the Lord a big hand clap for that. Thanks. Uh, go ahead, Alan. So then, um, this last year, so there's a university there, and we have one pastor. He was the one, he's bivocational, right? So he leads the sponsorship program, and he also pastors the church, right? So we felt like, man, this is a major place of outreach with this university. So we wanted to be able to have a second pastor who could focus on the university That's students right. to reach them. And you guys here at East Hill have come alongside for this next year and sponsored the salary for that pastor to get him started. So pray about that. We're in the process of finding that person. Uh, it's coming this next year. Well, we just felt like, I mean, strategically, we felt like the needs of the community were so overwhelming that the pastor of the church needed to be able to address that because it's just insurmountable. There's so much to be done that he would not be able to have the attentiveness or the time in his schedule to be able to give attention to the college campus. And I do want you to think University of Oregon. It is a ton of kids or any major, many major university, it is that type of place. And as we were on the campus, the Lord started speaking to me. I told Alan, I said, you gotta have a pastor, not just for the church, but for this city called this university. And so with the marriage of the two, how many understand that young minds need to be shaped in Christ too? We want them to get a great education, but we also want to shape their hearts and minds with the gospel and their worldview so that as they become the leaders of the nation, the leaders of industry and all of these things, they can then um, actually represent Christ in those spheres of influence. And so that's incredible, man. Yeah. So then the other piece, obviously, is sponsorship. So in the cracks in that community are all of these families uh, of, uh, of, you know, families primarily who have not had the chance to go to school, the parents, right? And so what that means is they make about a dollar a day. They work as, as, as security guards and as cooks and mm -hmm. as cleaners, and, uh, and they work on farms if they can get, you know, a job, and they struggle to feed their kids. That's yeah. why we help with food in certain situations, yeah. all of these kinds of things. And so uh, the, the reality is that there are still a lot of kids who need our help. So 57 were sponsored this morning in the first service. There are 42 more out there that are just like Rahima and Fiona that you saw in the video, oh. ultimately. Uh, they've been selected because they're in the bottom two tiers of poverty in Rwanda, their families are. So they are in real need. And the opportunity is when we go to a family and, and, and invite them to be a part of the program, we don't say, hey, we're now the parents of your child. No, you're the parent of your child, you're responsible for them ultimately, right? We're partnering with you on education because mm -hmm. that piece, that financial piece is what's a struggle for you. So we're partnering with you on education. You raise your child. We have a church here, and by the way, we don't sponsor kids because they're Christians. We sponsor them because they have a need. And then we share the gospel with them, right? So, right. so the, the message, though, when you sit, like when, when Pastor Fred sat down there with, with, with Fiona and Rahima's family, he said, we're coming alongside you. We're going to partner with you for education. We're going to share Jesus with them. But then you got to work hard, Rahima and Fiona, to do your job to get through high school. And ultimately, that's the track we're on. So if you sponsor with us today, $39 a month, that's what you're actually investing in is to make sure that one more child has that opportunity to make it through high school. Now, let me say something else. If some way along the way, way you have to drop a child, I want you to know that we don't tell kids in Rwanda, hey, if your sponsor drops out, we're sorry, okay? When we okay. sit down, when Pastor Fred sit, sat down with Fiona and Rahema, he said, if you work hard, we're going to help you get through. And on the back side of this, what we do is we make sure that if a sponsor has to drop out, we find another sponsor. So there's some kids out there that are, their high priority, the little red dot on, their, on the profile, those are kids who have lost their sponsor that need another sponsor. And in the meantime, we have a fund that covers them so that their education doesn't stop. Mm. So anyway, that, that's the big picture. When they graduate from high school, and by the way, you guys are new in this. It's been, you know, right. two, three years. Right. We've got churches that have been with us for a long time, right? So this year in Rwanda, 1,200 students will graduate from high school trade school, university, and seminary
because they've been supported by sponsors here in America. We're going to get there as East Hill, and, but we're on the beginning phases of yeah. it right now, and we just want to invite you to join us in that journey. Hey, Alan, yeah, amen, come on. Um, there's, there's a lot of conversation in America about schools and disadvantaged communities and that type of thing and what kind of education is being offered. Would you speak to the fact that the schools, uh, African New Life schools, are at the top echelon of education in the country? Would you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I wanna, so yeah, there is two things about this. So in Huye, we sponsor the education of children in, in many schools. So we provide a, a access, we pay the school fees because it's not free for them to go, you get that? But for, and some of those students, they're gonna go through high school and stay there, but the ones, if there's a student that is, right. they got, they're brilliant, right? And you see them when they're young, they're very smart. And in Rwanda, what you have to do to get out of sixth grade, you have to pass an exam. And if you don't pass the exam, you don't, you don't go any further. So, but that exam tells us, even at the sixth grade, okay, who's got it? The kids that are the top kids, that are in the top 1% that pass that exam, we send them to our university or to our, our best school. Kionza. You've preached at it yes. in Kionza. And these kids go on to do unbelievable things. But they, they're, they're, yeah, we send the ones that have the ability, the chops, yeah. for further academics to yeah. the best school. I, I sat with one of those students, this precocious little young man, and I said, well, what do you want to do after school? He says, I'm going to be a, uh, what is that? a cardiac thoracic surgeon, yeah. is what he told me. And I think there's not one, but one and in the country. He, he, he's from, yeah, Dr. Dios. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was sponsored in third grade. So these kids, so I'm, I'm from the streets, originally from Baltimore, right? So East Baltimore in particular. So I was a little cynical and like, yeah, you're running the game. You're the U.S. director, I already know, $1, maybe 50 cents ends up in the country and this, that, and the third. And so I had, I had some reservations when we went to Rwanda. And literally the day after we landed, we went to go, I think it was the day after the, you know, the two days successive, we were going to go exchange money. And as we were outside on the streets and I'm counseling our people, it's like, this ain't Mayberry, put your money back in your pocket. Like you're not in Gresham right now, put it away kind of thing. This kid, this African, this, this Rwandan walks up and he says, Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen, do you remember me? And he, I mean, he says, no, tell me the story. Kid that grew up, went through the system, had been sponsored and was now an accountant at an accounting firm, was taking care of his family and several other families and bringing kids along. And, and this happened literally, I, I think God knew I needed to be convinced. This happened three other times while we were there where kids just would randomly I, in, in fact, when we came through passport control, I had, I, I was stopped and the second time I had been in the country, and they said, Pastor Keith, you're coming to Africa New Life to preach. And it's like kids that were sponsored that were now passport control people in the country. So I thank God for what God is doing. I thank God that we started with two kids, Coco, and now we have four, <laughs> two boys and two girls. And I've watched myself personally, watched the health of these kids increase. They look very gaunt, very, very malnutrition when we first got them, and now to watch, and by the way, they know who we are. That's right. It's incredible. Would you pray? Yeah. Listen, you should never do anything out of compulsion. You should never do anything because your emotions are tied up, but you should do everything the Holy Spirit provokes you to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, we thank you that you are here with us. Lord, thank you that you have allowed us here in yes. Gresham, Oregon, at East Hill to have a part in answering prayers all the way mm. in Rwanda. Lord, thank you that you, that, that, that you see these kids, every one of them. Yes. You, you've listened to them. You've listened to their moms and their dads and their uncles and aunts pray for them for, for a way out of their situation. Lord, thank you that we get to be a part of that solution. Yes. Lord, that you saw that and you yes. see them. And Lord, we thank you that you see us in the yes. process too. So, Lord, we just thank you for these kids that are out there now, and we trust you that mm. in this room uh, you're going to meet many of their needs yes. because, of, because of us, yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you go, one of the things that as I was contemplating this and looking at our finances, I thought to myself, for the cost of coffee, for the cost of coffee, what I spend at Starbucks, I could literally change the trajectory of not just a child, but a child's generation and their families. And so... 
for me, it became a budgetary, materialistic kind of thing. I can sacrifice this for that greater good. So whatever the Lord would speak to you, and whatever sacrifice you need to make, it's worth it. I, I, I got it. It's going to be quick. I okay. promise. I promise. <laughs> okay. Because my daughter's watching okay. actually this service. So you don't know where your kid's going to end up. You sponsor your kid, you don't know what's going to happen, all right? So my daughter's a phlebotomist at Providence Hospital, right? So she takes blood at Providence Hospital. Not very long ago, she was in a room with a patient taking blood, and, and a nurse walked in. And, and uh, she heard her speak, and she could tell she was from Africa. She was an immigrant, <laughs> right? This nurse walks in. And so they're doing their work in there to, you know, for a little bit. And then the nurse looks at her and says, is your name Pamela? <laughs> she says, that's my sister. Uh, you know, no, but that's my sister. And then, and then the lady says to her, is your name Laura? Well, that's my daughter's name. She says, how do you know my name is Laura? And how do you know Pamela? And she says, I know your dad. I was a sponsored kid with African that's Life that's in Rwanda. Yeah. I got supported through college, and then because of that education, it opened the door for me to come to America. I got a second degree, and now a nurse at Providence Hospital in Portland, Oregon. Come on. So that's all I got. Thanks, Alan. Come on, give Alan a big hand. I don't know what this is. Thank you. Matt. So as I said, this is a different service. We're taking, you know, Dream Sunday and taking a look back at 2023. Now, we're going to run a video for you. Now, if you see something that is noteworthy, something that is praiseworthy, something that excites you, something that's like, yes, go Jesus, make noise whenever you want to. Does that make sense? And especially make noise if you're sitting next to an introvert person. No, let them do that. Love them well. Don't spill out into their area. Amen? But definitely demonstrate your love and appreciation for what God has done. How many of you know that God uses weak, frail human beings to do incredible things? Watch what God did through us last year. Come on.
Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's shout. I know that video was long, but it was worth it. And if you get a chance to tell Cody that you love him, he is the one that put that together, has to battle with all of the different departments about how much to show, what little to show, get video, get data points, all of that. Cody, we love you. We love you, Cody. And he is the most, un I would bring him up, he is the most unassuming, does not want that kind of attention, so we will not do it. But if you know him, you make sure you hug him real tight and love on him. Amen? I told Brandon, I said, we got to make sure that boy get a steak. We got to go take care of him because that's Red Bull for days. That's all kinds of problems, right? So listen, um, you have a financial handout. I only want to draw your attention to a couple high points. Um, Marjorie gave me some high points to mention, one of which is 1,121 people gave or family units gave last year to the work of the Lord. Let me just tell you um, how I feel about that. It makes me emotional. It is humbling. I'm grateful. None of us, we don't live in Beverly Hills over here. This is not one of those upper middle class sort of churches. To see what God has done with what we have given him is just astounding. Now, you've heard something called the return of the tithe. Let me clarify for you what that is. As a Foursquare church, we have covenanted together to take 10% of our tithes and income from local churches and send it to the national church, 10% there, so that we can further the gospel around the world, so we can send missionaries, plant churches together, that type of thing. Through the years, what we found, how many of you know ministry happens at the local church level, not the national church level? So with that being said, there was a movement four years ago to return the tithe back to us in increasing, mem me uh, increasing amounts and to shrink the large footprint that the, local that the national church had. And so they now return 40% of what we give to them. Don't ask me why we send it and they send it back. It's got some finance. Those of you that are smart with finances, you'll know why they do that. But we return 40% and those, that 40% cannot go into salaries, cannot go into the operations of the church. It must be used for missions work, missional. And when we say missions, just so you know, how many of you know America is a mission field too? So we believe in local, national, and global missions. And so Stacy and, um, and, and Deanna get to operate and drive me nuts because they're always wanting to do something. I think they're off to uh, El Paso, Texas to look at the immigration thing and, and, and those that are seeking asylum in America and the needs that they have. And I love what Alan said because we said this was said by the people in El Paso as well because we wanted to see they're going to actually be boots in the ground and see what is going on and how we can be a blessing. How many realize that people always must rise above our politics? Y'all not talking to me. This is important because I love African New Life, whether you're Muslim or whether you're Christian, it doesn't matter. If you're a child in need of an education, they bring you in. And, and, and I think those kind of compassionate outreaches and things we, we definitely need to part of, be a part of. And I think Jesus is in the midst of it. Um, let me say this about our general missions fund. We each month take a portion, uh, we, add, we take a secondary offering. Some of you give on a consistent basis. Then the first of the month, we take a missions offering. $91,000 in donations were collected above and beyond the tithe last year. Can you give the Lord a hand clap for that? For global missions. Now, now, with that, we are able to support the Abellos, Jason and Nikki Abello, the Malonans in Portland, uh, uh, in Poland, not Portland. Portland is a mission field, though. Uh, the Stormants in a country that will not be named right now, and they'll be back with us this summer. Um, we will not have them on stage because we can't video them at all, but they will be in the foyer. They'll be here. You'll get a chance to love on them and encourage them as they're on uh, a, a sabbatical to take a break from being in the country that they're in. I'm making sure I'm not saying anything because I don't want Stacy to get me, amen. And so we also have taken a portion of that $91,000 and given it to Foursquare Disaster Relief. So when things pop off in the country, hurricane, whatever it is that's popping off, even globally, we have an arm in Foursquare called Foursquare Disaster Relief where we come to you or we'll just decide as a team uh, Stacy leads that team. She'll talk to them and speak to them about what we should sow and what we should give. And so that happens. One of the things that was really good from the return of the tithe, um, 
one of the things that was really good in the return of the tithe was that we got a chance to give over nearly, I would say, $35,000 to Huye in particular last year to help finish the church. One of the things that becomes a problem in Africa is the churches sometimes have a lot of noise pollution because of sound. They don't have acoustic treatments and that type of thing. We were able to give our church that treatment so it wouldn't be a nuisance to the community around it by chairs and all the other accoutrements for the church so that they have a great place to experience the gospel. And so I'm super proud and thank you so much. Now we jumped out of this year with some transitions that have destabilized us a little bit and also we missed two Sundays in January. So we're down from our normal giving. So just, I, I don't panic over that stuff. I let the Lord, because I've learned through years and years that God still has coins in fish's mouths and that he does indeed provide for his work if we will follow him. And there are times where our faith gets stretched and challenged and I'm okay with that. How many of you know Jesus is building the church, not us? He's using us, but Jesus is involved. Amen? One thing I want to draw your attention to, uh, Deanna gave me some high points as well, but I'm most proud, and so is she, of our relationship. There's a lot of good that we've done. $41,000 was given in to get the road. I think it ended up being $52,000 after, after it ended up, uh, you know, after we got all the totals in. Four local, local organizations that impact children and families experiencing homelessness were blessed. Through also through East Hill, with, through an organization, a partnership with an organization called Rest RIP Medical Debt, we were able to now get this. We were able to, with them for pennies on the dollar, to retire $1.1 million worth of debt for Oregon fam medical debt for Oregon families, a chunk of them in Multnomah County. Come on. That's impactful. It is, it is a major cause for people to uh, go into bankruptcy having medical debt, and so we were able to wipe that out. And, and I just wonder, every now and then, I just wonder in my heart what, what it would be like to have, uh, you know, to, to go and check and find out that maybe five or $6,000 worth of debt in some area of medical was wiped away, and you get a note that says, we love you and so does Jesus, East Hill Church in Gresham. I just... I don't know what they put on the letter, but I just thank God that they know it's the Lord and a church in particular. The church has taken a hit because we are more known for what we are against in our country right now rather than for the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing that love with everybody we come into contact with. And what better way than to address a felt need that somebody has in their life and we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus extended to a hurting world. Touch your neighbor and say, that's a good thing. Tell them right now. That's a good thing. So there, I want to I wanna aim, so in a church our size, I think on any given Sunday, it's anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500, depending on who comes, depending on if the sunshine is out. Come on, y'all. And the sunshine is not out today, so you're in church. <laughs> anyway, let me say this to you. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. There are a million different things that we could get involved in. There's all of you have passion points and things that you want to get involved in, and we can't do it all. And that's why we partner with organizations, because we're not going to have every ministry. Not every church is going to address every ill in a community. We have to partner with the body of Christ, other churches like ours, and we're always looking to form those partnerships. Some churches are uniquely gifted to address certain needs. And so a, a small section of our team, and then we brought it to a larger section of our team, sort of created this pathway, went through a process to discover four strategic priorities that we're going to aim at, and not just us, but the entire ministry, every platform, every expression, are going to aim at these four things. And number one, out of the gate, the strategic priority for us is restoration and healing. And, and there's a statement on Nefer that says, we will address brokenness to encounter freedom and courage. How many know when you're broken, you don't have courage? When you're broken, you don't have hope. When there's devastation going on in your life, you're not launching out and there's impediments in your life. And we will empower people with tools to support, to enhance freedom. Now, I want you, if, when you see these, they will come to you written and we'll have this, this video sent back out to you this week. Underline what it says when it says tools and support. Because I can't fix your life. You can't fix mine. But what we want to do is resource you. And, and out of the Sunday morning, I've, by the way, the video of our service on the Sunday that we had family business that I began to talk to you about who I am and repent for some things that I did, that video is now approaching 1,000 people having viewed it. It's by far the most viewed video that we have in, in, in at least a year or so. And so here's what came out of that for me. Many of you stayed around after that service to come and speak to me and affirm and love, and, and, but, but every single person that I hugged said me too in some way. 
So that says to me that we're right on track with what God wants to do in our midst, that there's brokenness on your road, that all of us, and, and by the way, there should be no shame in your brokenness. There should be no shame in the fact that you have trauma or hurt in your life. The shame would be is that we would be a church talking about Jesus, talking about freedom, singing about freedom, and nobody ever experienced it. Now, now your healing, your healing won't happen just because you come to East Hill. It won't happen just because you come on Sunday morning at 1130. How many of you understand that you have to be intentional about engaging, engaging a healing process and pathway? That may mean that you need therapy. And some of you are like, I don't know how you go talk to a therapist. Well, what you're doing is not working. Maybe you ought to try something else. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe that person can provide you with wisdom, insight, or just sometimes hearing what you're going through as you are begin to process it can also be cathartic for you. But I'm just saying, here's what was said. Angie, uh, Angie Ritchie came to our church uh, during, a, during a month where we were dealing with mental health and we had a workshop. She said this word. I don't remember everything she said in the workshop. It was very clinical. It was a lot of stuff that was over my head. But I remember this. She said, it is not your fault what happened to you, but it is your responsibility to heal from it. I want to say that over here. It is not your fault what happened to you, but it is your responsibility to heal. And it is definitely on my heart because I'm a patriarch, both biologically and spiritually. And I want to make sure that I'm progressively getting healed so that what I'm imparting does not hurt or hinder, but gives life. Does that make sense? And so all of you have people that are attached to you. So then we want to make sure that you have resources and tools as a ministry to heal. Last year, 150 people engaged the healing pathways of discipleship here at the church, whether it be through a boundary study, whether it be through addiction uh, support, whether it be through beyond betrayal, beyond the betrayal, that's the wake that's caused by people with sexual addiction. And so I want you to not let shame keep you hidden away suffering while singing. I want this to be a real place where the hands and feet of Jesus are not only extended to a hurting world, but are extended to the members of the church. Touch your neighbor. Say, I need you. Tell them right now. Say, I need you. I'm grateful for a church and a space to be able to do that. Number two, these are not in any sequential order of importance at all. Um, the other thing is impact the city, impact the community. We will be a friend to the city. It is, it is one of the joys of my life to be called by the police chief, the city manager, uh, the fire department. We've done, fire, we've done funerals for the fire department. We are friends to our city. Now, we don't ascribe to all the politics. We don't ascribe to all of the philosophies that come out of there. But we want to see our city flourish. So we want to be in relationship and not be adversarial to them. And where we can partner, we will. And we do and the city calls on East Hill routinely to be a blessing to our community. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. That's, that's incredible. It's incredible. The other thing we want to do, so strategic priority is restoration and healing, impact the community, leadership development. These are going to come out to you. They'll be written. You'll, you'll see them ad nauseum because we're going to make sure that they just get embedded into the culture of our church. The next one is leadership development, and Jan Brower is somebody that's going to help me with this pillar as it will. Uh, we will mobilize the people of East Hill to do ministry. I, I believe 100% that we are not as good as we can be as a church. I believe 100% we are not as impact as much as that video just saw, that we just saw, showed tremendous impact, tremendous, tremendous impact that the Lord is doing through our church. We still aren't there. You know why? Because we don't have 100% of our people engaged in the ministry at some level. Like, like you, you, got, you can't tell me that you can't serve one Sunday a month to do something at the church that is building your life and restoring you to help us reach and continue to restore others. That, that by the way, your life finds its greatest significance in not what you're able to consume with your life, but what you also contribute there's a, there, the scriptures that it's blessed, more blessed to give than it is to receive. How many of you know that if you've been here for a little while, you should be doing a little something? Whether it be children, loving kids, and that type of thing. And somebody's like, I don't know no kids like that. Well, okay, we got ushers. We got, we got people on cameras. We got people on video. We got all types of platforms and expressions. And, and here's the truth of the matter. Not necessarily are the best people doing that work, but the most available people are doing it. 
People that have carved out a little piece of their life and said, Jesus, if you can use anything, use me. I don't feel necessarily called by God. I didn't get a burning bush to do it, but it is something that I can contribute. It's something I can do. I remember when they asked about children's ministry in our church or the nursery in our church, and I looked around and nobody raised their hand, and my pastor said, well, I guess nobody feels led. How many of you ever heard that before? He said, I guess nobody feels led, and I raised my hand, and Coco looked at me. She's like, you're going to be in a nursery? I just thought, this church is changing my life. Like week by week, these messages were impacting my life and changing my marriage. Like I got to give something back. And at that time, we weren't doing anything. And I said, okay, you need somebody to direct me. I didn't know they needed a, a nursery director. <laughs> like, like Marines should not be nursery directors. And I was fresh out of the Marine Corps, still smelling like Newports and F-bombs every other word. And I was in the nursery, but it was clean, it was ordered, and the mothers didn't like me much. So I didn't last very long in the nursery. Too loud or something of that nature. Every one of you has a gift. Every one of you has something has been deposited in your life by God that can be a blessing to other people. I'm watching people on stages. I'm watching people at front doors. I'm watching people drive around in golf carts, which I love to do, by the way. I mean, there's any number of things. There's security. There's, there's any number of things. And one of the things I want to challenge the men in our church is in children's ministry. We usually abdicate that as women's work. And I want to reaffirm that that is toxic masculinity at its best. And that the truth of the matter is, is there's a generation of young boys and young girls that need to see godly men in ministry. Now you say, well, I, I can't get up and teach. I know. Can you hand out some crayons? Can you chase Johnny around who's got ADHD and say, sit down, Johnny, for the fifth time? Sit down. Can you corral some kids a little bit? Can you play duck, duck, goose? Yes, you can. You are not that cool. You just aren't. I know your friends think so, but you aren't. We need some men in the children's ministry to show up and represent for, for kids like maybe the way I grew up who didn't have a dad in the home, who didn't understand that kind of order, hold on, who didn't understand that kind of order or that kind of love. There's a ton of men that never got affirmed love or don't know what masculine, masculine, masculine affection feels like, looks like, sounds like. If we don't have that in our children's ministry, there's a generation of kids growing up right now without dads in the home. Some of you could do that. One Sunday a month, you could do that. And then the rest of the Sunday, you could serve one service and sit in the next service. You could, you could do it on the same Sunday. If there is a willingness of heart to do it, you could do it. And we need that because we're trying to disciple a generation. And oftentimes when they come, we don't have enough child care coverage so that we can provide ministry to the whole family at the same time. So that's a need, and I'd like to see every single one of you engaged. If you've been sitting around this church, I would say more than two months, and you've made this your house, you need to really settle up and say, you know what, I need to get involved. Get on that QR code and put in the volunteer application and say, I'm done. I'm going to help. I will do something. And if every one of us does a little something, how many know we get to do a big thing together? Touch your name and say, I need you. Tell them right now. And lastly, um, I'm going to let you go because we've been here a long time. Next gen is zero to 25. Um, we will invest in the next generation and the adults in their inner circle. This is, for me personally, a passion point. It is a mandate that I believe from the Lord. Uh, at, let's get Brandon and Noah to come. Here they, here they come. Um, I was handed this on the day that I was appointed. Jason Abello gave this to me. And um, if you know it, this is a baton. If you've ever seen a 4 by 4 100, you, you understand what you do with it. You pass it. One of the things, I, I've got friends um, at the University of Oregon still, and uh, one of them was the track coach during the best years of the track and fields and, and was responsible for the women's 4 by 100 team. And I asked him a little bit about this, and what he said to me was fascinating. He said, Keith, the idea is, is that you would pass the baton and, and not lose speed as much as you can. The idea would be is that you pass it, 
This one is coming in. This one is up and running. You pass the baton without losing momentum as much as you can. But he also said to me, and I, I think I've said this to you, is there's a zone that you, you have to do it in. That if you do it outside that zone, you're disqualified. And so there is this sense that the church, I, I want you to understand, I'm 58 years old. I know I look good because black don't crack. Ain't that right, Brandon? <laughs> That's right, brother. So, brother. You see him? <laughs> We're not the future. We're not the future. I'm not the future of the church. And I look around this room, if you missing hair, and you got hair coming out your ears and all kinds of stuff, you're not the future either. We have a contribution to make, but here's what the church usually does. I remember sitting in church, Eric, I remember sitting in church in Baltimore, Maryland, and then I heard it there, and then I heard it as a young disciple again, where the pastor said, I'm going to die in the pulpit, bless God. I'm going to give my last sermon, and I'm going to give up the ghost. I'm like, that's traumatic. You don't want to die on a Sunday in church. But you know what he told me in that moment? Because I was thinking, maybe the Lord wants to use me to preach. Maybe I could do something. He told me in that moment that I would never be in the pulpit. Because he's going to be there every Sunday until he died. He just said it. And what the church has done is we usually pass this. Oh, come on up here, Seth. Hurry up. Jump yourself up here. No, come up the steps, son. You did that. I like the way you did that. That's pretty cool. I can't do that right now. No, don't <laughs> get off here. So, so instead of me, get, get ready to run that way, instead of me get him, giving him the baton early enough to allow him to learn, grow, be coach, mentor, make mistakes, and then be able to go and run, and then I get to go, that's my son. Look at him do what he does. Instead of doing that, he's waiting for the baton. Come this way, son. The church is notorious, I, I, exactly. <laughs> and then we drop it. We get too old, the resources are spent, the church is dwindled. Now the church only likes the music I like because I'm old and I like this kind of music. And I don't want a whole bunch of, and it's too loud. Oh my God, it's too loud. And you guys are doing this. Why are the kids jumping up and down? I can't see. All of that stuff. We create the church in a generation's image who won't be the future. Do you know there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches right now that are empty because they didn't affect this generational handoff that allowed the church to continue to flourish into the next generation? Now, you guys play. I don't know if you notice what's happening right now. The baton is being passed every time you see one of these young ones. Come here, Addie. Hurry up, Addie, quick. Grab the microphone, Addie. Grab the mic, Addie. Come here, baby girl. Come on. Baby, what happened? Come on, babe, don't worry about it. Let Andrew do that. You support her, Andrew. Come up here. Look at, don't be all nervous, loosen up. All right, show me one of my pictures real quick. Ha. Where, where, where would you rather her be than on the service, on this stage? You know what we did with young people? We said, hey, you got a gift and we love you, but go in that back room and do it over there for 10 years of your life. And then she gets to be 18 and then she says, and we say, you're kicked out of there where the kids are, and we need you to come into the big space, but she's never been here. This wasn't her church. Her relationships are all over there. And then she says, why come to church anymore? Now she's gone in college, and some secular humanist is trying, you're not going to sing, don't worry about it. I'm not, I know you're worried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just using you. I just need you here with me, baby. So she goes to college, and a secular humanist undoes her faith, which was never really built in her yet. She still needed us. She needed mothers and fathers in the faith 
to love on her, to nurture her, to give her room and space to ask questions and to make dumb mistakes and that it would be okay that she did that among us so that she could then say, this is my church. You know what this is going to require? Sacrifice on our part, space. But, but here's, the, here's the cool part. Brandon's not saying I'm replacing anybody. And I'm not saying that we're going to replace anyone. What we are saying is, is they are our reinforcements. They strengthen us. They help us see things we can't see. They help us see things anew. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm with my grandchildren, they always show me things that I've seen a million times. But every now and then they show me something in a way that I can't see it any other way. You helped me see Rwanda in a way that I couldn't see it. We sat outside the coffee shop and talked and had pictures and just did our thing. Mm -hmm. This is what this church must do. It must be a part of what we do. We've got to love our children. Now, here's what's funny to me. Go ahead, baby. You can sit down now. The church is pro-life. Come on, right? Church is pro-life. I got you. Then if we're pro-life, we got to make room. We got to coach. We got to mentor. We got to love them and bring them up. And yes, they're going to be messy. And yes, every Sunday you ain't going to hear your favorite worship song. And every time you don't hear it, I don't want you complaining. I want you saying they're making room for what's coming. The scripture says this in Judges chapter 2. Noah, why don't you play? Brandon, why don't you go hands off? Yeah, we're waiting on you, brother. Do your thing, Noah. Mm. Come on, Brandon. Come on, have a seat, brother. He don't need you. He's been coached. He's been coached. Noah, your church loves you, supporting you, making room for you. Not just you, I'm your representative of a generation. We're saying we value you. We're saying you're not less than. We're not believing the narratives of your generation that the culture has given us. We're saying you're worth investing in. We're saying we see the beauty and the image of God in you in a way that we can't see it any other way. Put Andrew, put the picture of Andrew up with, with Rosie. See that picture? Go back one. Give me the other picture of Andrew. See that one? Who's got the mic right now? Wait, wait. Who's got the mic? Andrew does. Go to the next picture. Who's got the mic? That's a perfect illustration of what we're trying to do. Where's the old heads on the picture? In the back. And you know what we were doing at that time? We were like, look at them. They doing their thing. We were like grandmothers and grandfathers being proud of watching the next generation. They ain't doing it like we would do it. They need some coaching. <laughs> I, I tell Andrew all the time, come over here, let me talk to you. Get over here. He can tell you, I'm constantly twisting and turning and doing things, but that's where we are. We're still needed, we just are not at the forefront all the time. So if you see Brandon, he's not leading worship, don't ask him, why are you not leading worship? Look at the fact that he doesn't have to that we have others coming up. Come on, stand to your feet with me all over the building. That's a passion point for us. I grew up in a church that young people, you know, how, many, how many grew up in a house where people, or a generation where people said, children should be seen and not heard? Yeah, not in God's house, not in God's house not among his people. I want you to pray for us as we continue. We can't, listen, I want you to understand, we can't do this if God doesn't help us. And God responds to prayer. So if you'll pray consistently, there'll be like this, under, this undergirding of prayer in the house. I mean, you know, God will do miraculous things. Every morning you should, you should set it in your phone. And just say, I need to pray over the house. And you pray over our pastors, and you pray over our leaders, and you pray over our ministries, and you pray over our city, whatever it is. You should set that in your alarm, in your phone, to just remind you 
Because all of us forget. How many times have you told somebody you would pray and forgot? No, you don't want to raise your hand to that. It's like, it's like I'm, I do. That's why I write it in my phone now. I believe the Lord is among us, in spite of it all. I'm assured that God has got me by my hand and walking me slowly at times, slower than I want, through all of the seasons of life. And our church is becoming more and more like the kingdom of God and what Christ ordained for us to be. Amen? You find a place to serve, continue to pray. We're going to aim at these priorities as the Lord empowers us and resources us to do so. Find a place to plug in. Amen? Let's bow our head on our hearts before the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, bless this house. Bless your people. Bless your people. Prosper them. Keep them. May they be in health. May every single place you want to take them, they have the courage to follow you and become the men and the women of God that you call them to be. Heal us. Send us to impact the city and the world. Cause us to be leaders in industry in different places, Lord. Activate every one of us in the house. And then, Lord, help us to launch another generation to impact the city. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.